Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. A. David Lewis, and I have the pleasure of speaking today all the way from the Netherlands with Dr. Neil Cohn. Neil, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for uh, joining me today, or letting me join you, I should say. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. As you know, I've wanted to do this for some time, dating back even to your time uh, local to me here in Boston at yeah. the University. Yeah, I remember uh, getting together with you in Harvard Square at some point in, I think, like 2006, maybe. Yeah, good memory. And that's now... Much younger, much more hair. And uh, yeah, I still... Uh, yeah, it's quite, yeah. a, quite a number of years ago. It's about 13 years ago. We're speaking today. Uh, it is August uh, 23rd, 29th. October, I think it is. Yeah, I'm going to edit that part out. It's <laughs> We're a little, it, I wish it was August still, but uh, right. yeah. It is October 23rd, uh, 2019. And I wanted to take this opportunity to chat with you on uh, basically the state of your research, which uh, I have a, a, a complementary argument for, not against, but, but for. Uh, but first, I'd like to really familiarize people who either uh, aren't familiar with your work or are only familiar with aspects of it, uh, either online with your visual language lab or with your publications. Um, I didn't prep you with this specific question, but could you just talk about ever so briefly your background that brings you now to Tilburg? Yeah, so, I mean, I started on this journey, I guess, when I was a teenager, and I was very uh, intensely into drawing comics, as many of us were, uh, and I'd always had kind of a very theoretical mindset with it. Uh, I obsessed over things like understanding comics and tutorials that were in Wizard Magazine and yes. uh, many other sort of uh, places. Uh, and when I was a teenager, I started working for Image Comics, uh, spending my summers working for them at Comic-Con. Um, specifically, I worked for Image for a couple of years, and then I worked for Todd McFarlane specifically. Um, and uh, so because of that, I kind of got a inside track on getting advice and stuff from uh, people within the industry. And that was very valuable to me. And I had always just intended to draw comics. And then in college, I took some courses on linguistics and noticed that things were going on in language that were similar to what I understood was going on in uh, comics and then uh, in the graphic part of comics, I should say. Uh, and then um, I just kind of kept pursuing this and writing my ideas down and then pursuing it in grad school and now uh, as a faculty member here at Tilburg University. Um, and my conception of this was always in terms of cognition. When I first started, it was much more on the linguistic -y side. And then in grad school, I was in a program of experimental psychology. And so I started focusing a lot more on the actual psychology side and experimentation. And then I've continued with that um, uh, since grad school. So now I kind of have uh, several different techniques that I balance out. So I have both the kind of theoretical linguistic side. And these days I probably do a lot more of the experimental work, but the experimental work and the, the Theoretical work are all interrelated, so there's all they're all combined together. Um, yeah, I think yeah. it's worth I think it's worth pointing out that when you say experimental work, you're not saying uh, necessarily work at the fringes. Work experimental, as in uh, radical. You're saying experimental, really, in terms of experiments and data collected uh, towards your theory. Correct. Yeah, so my work, um, I'm an experimental psychologist in terms, so particularly a, either a, a, I guess you'd say a cognitive neuroscientist or cognitive psychologist. So in my case, what we do is we have people actually take experiments and many people from online have taken my experiments. Uh, thank you all very much if you have. Um, and you, we do online studies where pe we, people read comics and we see uh, there are different uh, behaviors. Uh, we, I have a lab, I, just this morning we had a participant where they come into the lab and we put electrodes on, uh, their, an electrode cap on their heads and we measure their brain waves. Uh, we've done eye tracking studies. We've done quite a lot of different techniques. Um, but we do this to basically understand how it is that the human brain uh, 
uh, and mind understands a sequence of images. How is, it that you, how is it that you make meaning out of a sequence of images? Not necessarily in a literary way, but in the most basic understanding way of, in the same way that you can ask, how is it that we make sense of a sequence of sounds that are coming out of my mouth that you understand it's not just that has meaning to it and you make meaning out of it. How is it that you can look at an image and see a, uh, a, uh, uh, these lines and shapes and make meaning out of that as a sequence of images? Yeah, you're putting really uh, the data and looking at the synaptic um, um, foundation behind understanding comics, whereas a great deal of comic studies may theorize and may analyze, uh, I see you as taking that and really uh, experimentalizing it, in addition to building your own theory. In fact, I want to talk about, uh, if we could, uh, one of your theories. Uh, in your book, The Visual Language of Comics, which I have here, available uh, for purchase where all fine books are sold. Um, you were able to test your theories on the structure and grammar of comics by yeah. instead monitoring specific types of brain activity. Could you discuss some of the potential for other quantitative or and observable experimentation that, that could be done to support various comics theories? Yeah, so um, I just say, so the, the, the work that was reported in my, in my, my book there, most of that experiments was, uh, were all done while I was in graduate school. And um, the primary brain studies there were essentially what were my master's and dissertation experiments. Um, since that time, we've done, you know, six times as many uh, studies. Like we have way, way more studies about this and data. Um, both brain data and other types of data. So if you're asking about, um, I, I think what the question is, is related to what other types of methods can you use besides just measuring the electrical activity of the brain. Um, and really, there are many, many types of uh, experiments that you can use in psychology or experimental methods. Um, and the types that I use are typically those that are used in psycholinguistics or in linguistics to study uh, the structure of language. Um, my particular, my main thing is doing brain responses, but we've done all sorts of things. So we uh, also do things like uh, reaction times. Uh, how long does it take someone to process something? Uh, a very common technique that we use is we have people read uh, comics and they typically unfurl one panel at a time, and we simply measure how long it is they spend reading that panel. So in that case, the duration that you spend reading a panel is supposed to be indicative of the you know, cost of processing that particular panel. Usually we're not doing it for what's in the panel, but for how that panel relates to a broader sequence. And we then manipulate all sorts of different things. Um, we also might do things like eye tracking and seeing where the eyes move around a page. We might do um, things like making people choose where they would put a certain panel into a certain uh, sequence and then also measure reaction time as well as their choices for where they put things. So there's a host of different types of measurements that you can use, uh, and they all really tell you something a little bit different. And really, I think what it comes down to is thinking about the questions you're asking and then using the appropriate method to test the questions you're asking. Another uh, method that I haven't mentioned that isn't necessarily um, a test of cognition per se, but is to look at the properties of comics. And so you code all the different types of sorts of things that are in various comics. And then you can look from there at what are the properties of different comics of the world. For example, on average, do Japanese comics have a certain structure that's different than American comics and European comics or French versus Dutch comics or things like that. And then you can tell what different structures might be at play. And that's another way of using data to look at what's going on in the structure. People may be familiar with, um, in Scott McCloud's understanding comics, he sort of touches on this. He starts, but he's just looking at panel transitions, just one yeah. to the other. And then uh, what he uh, assessed at the time 
were the predominant panel transitions for certain genres or certain cultures of comics. But I think yeah. you struck on as early as your earlier book, 2003, yeah. is that we can't just consider the panels one to one, yeah. one to the next. Um, right. And I feel that that might be something that uh, a trap that a number of scholars fall into, either only considering the single panel or the single panel with what's immediately juxtaposed to it, or right. only considering the whole page or story arc. And you work at sort of this sweet spot as to how they work in tandem, how they peak uh, yeah. grammatically, and then how that uh, is processed. Right. Yeah, so, um... I, I feel like, uh, yeah, but so we talked about the panel transition analysis. Actually, the kind of McLeod's coding of different types of panel transitions across the world or across these different types of comics. When I read that, I thought that that was the most compelling part of that chapter. Sure. It wasn't just that there were panel transitions. It was that he was able to tell something about different systems yeah. by encoding them. And one of the things I think that has been uh, lost or just starting to come into studies of comics quite a bit is this sort of data-driven analysis where you actually code the properties of comics and look at what is happening in comics. I think for a long time, most people, you know, when they argued uh, for or against McLeod's positions, it was very much in the theoretical realm, but that sort of just methodological technique kind of got lost along the way amongst many scholars. Um, and that sort of data-driven thing is something I've always been interested in, even back to my first sort of coding of comics, which I originally did back in like 2003, but didn't publish until many years later. Uh, and now we have a, a quite a substantial amount of research doing that sort of technique. In fact, that's the basis for a grant that I just received uh, and will be working on uh, for the next five years. Um, but um, to get to your earlier point about sequencing, yeah, I, I think... When you look at um, the relationship between two panels, I think you're being, have, it's a very limited sort of relationship that you're looking at. Uh, and if you're characterizing the meaningful changes between just those two panels, you're essentially casting your spotlight on a very small portion of the relationships that might be there. And I think uh, when people are, considering my research, really I think what a lot of it boils down to is I'm saying there's lots of patterns involved in visual sequencing. And that's essentially my argument is it's not just types of relationships, it's sequencing patterns. And those sequencing patterns are very systematic and patterned. To be um, fair, it's not just an argument, you're backing it actual with uh, actually monitoring brain activity and response. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's part of it also, is that if you're... For their credit. <laughs> right, well, thank you. Um, if you're... Uh, and I think that's another part, is that if... And I'm, I'm fair for people to, say, critique my, my work and propose other models and stuff. That's, that's great. That's how science progresses. But you also have to engage with the data in that sense and engage with what the data shows you. So you can make a critique about a theory but if your competing theory can't account for the brain responses that are shown in various experiments or the reaction times and whatnot, it's not gonna be able to hold up because it has to hold up to the, all of the data that's present. And that's true of my work as well. And there have been cases where we have hypothesized some theoretical structure and then we run an experiment and in fact the experiment shows us something very different and then we think, oh, well, maybe we have to rethink the way I think that the structure actually works. Right. And then we uh, either alter it or change it or um, add additional constraints for why we think it might be happening the way that the data guide us. Uh, and this is just the way that science works. You, it iterates. So um, you, know, you have a theory and then you look at what the data tells you and then you go back to your theory and adjust. What I find so beautiful about it actually, and I'm thinking beautiful mind kind of beautiful, is that you can use this science to look at content outside the sciences. You can use this science to record and examine how people respond to uh, uh, works of genre, um, my own studies being in 
uh, graphic religion, right? Mm -hmm. And more recently in graphic medicine, but you don't have to assign uh, scientific inquiry only to scientific content. As I know you use peanuts. You use Charles Schultz's peanuts comics at yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the, the reason we use peanuts is because there's a lot of them and we're able to manipulate them to create the structures that we want using the number that there are. And so we, we really, in a lot of ways, create a lot of novel peanuts strips, which I know is somewhat blasphemous from an artistic point of view, but um, we try not to publish them that much. That's one of the reasons I have so many little Snoopies all over the place, because people give me Snoopy things because of this. Um, but we have been using some other comics as well lately. So we have, um, we also now have a corpus built of Calvin and Hobbes comics that we've been using. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have also used for uh, a couple studies, um, uh, The Savage Dragon by Eric Larson. I was just looking for that. You actually catalog the different fists. That <laughs> yeah, in my book I did that. But we, we've run experiments using Savage Dragon now as well. That's fantastic. Um, and um, it, it really, again, it just depends on the type of um, uh, structure we're looking at. So we use Savage Dragon at one point because the first three issues of The Savage Dragon had a very interesting um, storytelling structure that spanned those issues. And so we wanted to exploit that. And we actually used that basic structure and manipulated it um, in various ways. Uh, and at times, look at what we were interested in. At times, you use your own art, your your own yeah, book. so I mean, I'll draw stuff here and there as well. Um, uh, so when we do these studies, for example, of what I call upfixes, which are these things that float above the head like stars or gears or hearts, uh, it's very specifically the ones that are above the head. So it's supposed to be a visual affix that's up, and thus it's an upfix. Yeah. Uh, rather than a prefix or suffix, it's an upfix. Um, and terminology for the umlaut, when something appears yeah. In the place of the character's eye. Right. Dollar yeah. Dollar. So, <laughs> yeah, in those cases, I did most all the drawings for those experiments because they were just simply easier for me to draw, basically, than to find examples of. And it's easy to, to have a systematic version of it. Uh, and now, <laughs> amusingly enough, all of those examples that were um, we used, I also put on T-shirts. So we have T-shirts that have all of our experimental <laughs> material on them. Um, I'm also featuring uh, art from one of the conferences. So I feel like comic nice. studies is also generating uh, its own lexicon of art at the same time. And Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I try not to use my own drawings too much. And then oftentimes the students I have who are running experiments of their own might be also people who can draw and will draw their own either manipulations of, of things or novel things or will tweak things to be uh, usable. And a lot of times the reason why we're able to do this is because the thing that we're testing is not actually a um, pattern from the comics that we're testing. They're not patterns from peanuts, but we use peanuts to create those patterns. And a great example of this is where we found in one study that the patterns um, in Japanese, the readership of Japanese comics uh, modulates how the brain responds to patterns that come from Japanese come the come from they're used more in manga so there's certain patterns let me say that again there's certain patterns that are used more in manga than western comics right. we then did a brain study testing that pattern we then found that people's brain responses were modulated by the degree to which they read japanese comics so that is the experience with japanese comics altered the way their brain responded to that pattern now what was interesting about that also is that they weren't reading Japanese comics. They were reading Peanuts comics that happened to have been manipulated to have a structure wow. more like manga. So it's about the patterning in the sequence in that case, not about the specifics of the graphics that they're, they're looking at. Let me fast forward just slightly to some more recent publications. Uh, I yeah. know uh, you've had some publications this year in journals like uh, Language and Cognition and in Topics and Cognitive Science. and uh, the reason I'm focusing on those two is that both of them address the idea of interfacing. And if I understand that term correctly, um, it's when there are two levels mm -hmm. of visual language, uh, of in visual language, a visual language like comics. So you have semantic structure and you have narrative structure. Yeah. 
my question not only is can you help define them uh, for the audience, sure. also how can people who are reading comics notice these structures at play if they're not in your lab, if they're not already hooked up oh, to sure. Yeah. So um, semantics, the, the semantic level of representation, as we, I would say, is the cognitive principles that contribute to meaning. So if you look at, uh, if you hear the word dog, that's just a string of sounds, but the word dog links to a meaning of a particular type of animal in this case. Okay. Uh, if you see a picture of a dog or a, uh, a Snoopy doll and know that it's a dog, um, you map that those visual features to something that tells that is telling you that this is a dog. The thing that is the concept is the semantic structure, uh, as opposed to the the sensory signal that is that's linking to it. So that sensory signal is about meaning, and if you have a sequence of images, then you're linking those meanings in a sequence. So those scenic, those meanings have to be linked together somehow. And this is essentially what like panel transitions are arguing for: is that there's meaningful relationships across panels. And my argument is that, that there's not only this sort of semantic level of representation, but there's also a narrative structure. Okay. And the narrative structure is, as I said before, basically just patterns. So there's patterns of sequencing that are guiding how that uh, meaning might come to play. So sometimes those patterns might leave out information. Then you might have a sequence that is a, a pattern of, uh, uh, of structure, but you're missing certain information. And then you have to fill that information in because you're missing what's given to you. A common one is something like uh, where you drop out a primary action. So you, somebody reaches back their arm, and then the next panel somebody has a black eye. Now what you're missing is the primary punching action, right? And in that case, the structure shows you a preparatory sort of state, a rising action in terms of narrative. You think about it, or, and then you have an aftermath or a denouement, as it were, but you're missing the climax. So, so this the, is a pattern structure where you drop out the climax. So all the semantic pieces are largely there. You have something that shows a fist and you relate that in your mind to what your experience of fists are in the world and, and people who use fists. So you identify, ah, that's a boxer and ah, that's an opponent, but you're saying that's at the semantic level. On the narrative level, um, you're looking for a piece um, that you might generate yourself if it's not provided to you, the, the blood in the gutters uh, effect? Yeah, and it, in this case specifically, this is the inference that you're filling in. But I think that in, to some degree, and what I argue in what some of those papers is that the the argument that there's like inference happening all over the place all the time is a little bit overblown to some degree because you're not doing it everywhere. And there are different types of panels that can be dropped out and recognized as when they're missing to different degrees than others. So panels that would typically be a setup, you don't care if they're missing, but if you're missing a climactic moment, you really care. And so and panels means- are functioning in different ways. And that's part of the, patterning of the sequence that allows you to guide the meaning into happening. It's just not that the, the patterns and the meaning are, aren't the same thing. And that takes me back actually to McLeod, to understanding comics. We're not disparaging him by offering this. It's a good start. Yeah. Um, uh, but what he categorized as a non sequitur, yeah. and that's going to depend on the audience. That's going to depend on which inferences they insert or cannot insert Right, and, and what's funny is that sort of non sequitur often only um, is categorizable if you're looking at the immediate juxtaposed relationships. Here we go. Oftentimes what would be considered a non sequitur are not actually completely sort of anomalous panels if you look at a broader context of a sequence. Even in the page where he defines what a non sequitur is, his non sequiturs that he puts in the sequence are actually congruous um, right. uh, yeah. in the context of the sequence that he's telling. And in fact, in that case, the text carries more of the meaning than the images do. And so it doesn't need the images to have, have uh, congruity. Let's talk text for just yeah. a second. I have long admired um, and enjoyed your work dating back to Tufts and even uh, at that time. 
But while a good deal of your work originates in linguistics, uh, as mm -hmm. you said, and, and Saucer, and um, the words are often sidelined in your in your experimentation, and perhaps that's necessary. Um, and so, but how might verbal language, or rather textual language, maybe mm -hmm. more accurate, um, become part of this study of visual language? Yeah, so I think it's actually kind of funny because um, though the focus has primarily primarily been on my uh, on the visuals, mostly because there's a lack of that in the body of research. So if you want to talk about how they combine, you have to know more about the visuals to be able to talk about how they combine with the verbal. Uh, but in fact, I've been writing about the combinations of text and image since 2003. So back, uh, you might remember, uh, when I first was kind of coming into the scene, I would just post PDFs on my website. Now we would call those preprints, but um, back then it was just, I didn't think about journals or anything. I would just, you know, put it on my website. And I had a paper in 2003 called Interactions and Interfaces, which was about multimodal combinations. Um, and both, yeah. and that paper originally, now that got broken up into two separate papers, one of which is a paper called Beyond Word Balloons and Thought Bubbles, which is about the spatial integration of text and image. And the other one is called a Multimodal Parallel Architecture, which is in the journal Cognition in 2016. And that paper really argues that uh, uh, um, it, it essentially, um, uh, I just got the note, so I'm pause there. Um, so um, what that paper essentially argues is that the structure of visual language and the structure of verbal language are all part of one system. Yes. And um, I, I effectively say that, I effectively do integrate all of the information about verbal language and visual language and also sign language and gesture um, and integrate them all into one cognitive model. And I, I use as the basis for this, my mentor, uh, Ray Jackendoff's uh, parallel architecture is called his model. And I essentially expanded his model to account for additional uh, components for graphic information and bodily information also. Um, and so really, my research intrinsically is hooked into uh, theories that combine text and image together. So um, the basis of my theories are that they, are, they belong to one system and they are playing different uh, parts emerging based on what's activated within a common system. And we have done some um, experimentation. So uh, one of the first ones we did about text and image was these cases where you have an action that's missing and instead you get an onomatopoeia. So like you reach back the arm, you get the word pow, and then you get the black eye. And we did a, we've done a couple studies with these sorts of things where you fill in the, the text instead. And we did show that the uh, context of the visuals modulates how the brain understands the verbal information, okay. showing that they are integrated together. And I've been on a, some works with collaborators also doing the reverse. So you put images like emoji into sentences. And we've done some published studies of that too. Um, so all of it combines into, into one larger picture of, of the relationship between all kind of human expression in terms of how we convey meaning, whether it's spoken or written or visual, graphic, uh, bodily, and how those different forms manifest as different types of expressions and how they combine together. And when we spoke earlier, as we were preparing for today's interview, you alluded yeah. to the future uh, research you have coming up, does that tie in? Is that more explicit there? Um, well, to some degree. So, I mean, I teach a course here at Tilburg called Multimodality uh, Communication and Persuasion, which I teach with uh, my colleague, Jos Schilkrud. And um, we, so this model that I proposed in this 2016 paper, I have subsequently expanded quite a bit and um, we intend at some point to write a book about this um, uh, additional model that accounts for, I mean, in our class we cover comics and emoji and memes and infographics and basically everything that you can think of that involves some sort of com combination between two modalities. But you're not um, saying they're the same thing, you're saying that they may be processed in an umbrella manner, yes? 
Uh, yeah, well, they, the, the, the multimodal information are processed in an integrative way because ultimately the uh, building cognitive building blocks that are going into understanding images and text are combined in the same system, ultimately. Um, it's all, it all belongs to one system. It's just it's using different portions of that system depending on how that information is being, which, which modalities are manifested. Um, and I have, I mean, I have a lot of research that's going on um, in uh, uh, my, uh, some of my projects, yeah, we're looking at the relationship between structures in spoken language and structures in visual languages, for example. Um, we're also looking at um, the processing between uh, uh, the, the structure of language and the structure of graphics as well. Um, we have a number of different studies in, in different dimensions that are exploring these relationships. As you said earlier, though, people don't have to fly to the Netherlands in order to take part in your research. You're frequently enlisting people online to, yeah. to yeah. online tests and, and Yeah, we have a lot of online studies, so we'll just post a link on Twitter and then people can come take it. I also have an email list if people will, like actively want to do experiments. They're welcome to email me and sign up for my email list, in which case sometimes we'll you know, a couple times a year, you usually get an email saying, we have a study, it takes about 15 minutes, log on, just jump on your computer and look, read comics for, you know, 15 minutes, basically. And, um, here, and here's my pitch. I, I alluded to this at the uh, beginning of our interview. I particularly think that individuals who are interested in graphic medicine should uh, have an, uh, a special interest in your work. Uh, not only because it's enlightening and it's doing, uh, it's pioneering in a number of ways, um, but the, the science that's behind it, uh, which I've long appreciated, feels very much to me like um, taking graphic medicine's mandate, and for people who uh, are not intimately familiar with it, loosely speaking, graphic medicine is uh, the intersection of comics and healthcare, comics and medicine, comics and patient wellness. In many of those cases, it's how the comic is being used to either represent or as a tool for those overlapping populations. But what I like most about your work, uh, Neil, is that now we're taking the body and the mind and the neuropsychology and seeing how it wraps itself around the comic. It feels like it's on the same continuum that we look at for graphic medicine, but perhaps in the reverse direction. Could I get your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the degree to which like basic cognitive research and um, uh, medicine are essentially on a continuum uh, depending on what you're doing with the sort of research you're looking at. So when I was in graduate school, the lab I belonged to, um, my, well, my, one of my other mentors, Gina Cooperberg, she not only looked at um, basic research like I did, but she had a whole branch of our lab that looked at schizophrenia, for example. Um, so there is more clinical research, um, but it's all hooked together. So it's really just kind of which part you're looking at. And I have an active research program uh, about autism uh, currently uh, with my colleague Emily Coderre, who's at uh, the University of Vermont. And we have a, a full research program together looking at um, uh, comics and autism and cognition and again, neurocognition um, related to autism. And we have quite a number of projects and grants that we have under review uh, about this work. And we've both been writing quite a lot about um, the findings that we have, many of which are sort of um, uh, going against the common presumptions that people have. Uh, for example, the idea that visuals are easier to process than verbal for people who um, often have um, challenges or a different type of processing for language, there's an assumption that they have a easier processing of visuals. Uh, and in fact, we're not showing that we're showing that they have um, uh, the same types of processing differences in language as they and in visuals. Uh, but what's interesting about that is that there's some additional work um, showing that the experience people have with 
um, uh, uh, reading comics matters. So for example, uh, there's a really interesting dissertation that came out of Berkeley recently by a guy named Alexander Blum, who was looking at how um, uh, autistic individuals um, uh, uh, create inferences for things that are in comics uh, yeah. versus inferences for things that are mentioned in a textual story. And he found that in general, the inferences were recognized uh, more poorly in the comics. Uh, in, sorry, I should say the neurotypical individuals uh, recognize the inferences more often than the um, uh, uh, individuals with autism. However, um, this was modulated by the degree to which people had comic reading experience. So um, in the neurotypical individuals, inferences were recognized more by neurotypical individuals who read more comics. So you clearly saw a gradation based on the degree to which they read comics. And the same gradation is shown in the uh, uh, degree of comic reading by individuals with autism, where um, if the people who read more comics were able to understand the inferences better. And in fact, the people who were really frequent comic readers understood the inferences as at equal level to the neurotypical individuals. Um, uh, so so essentially comic reading proficiency, sorry, say that again? I was gonna say, so, so their training in comics, their experience and practice with comics uh, basically and if I'm using the wrong uh, words, you can certainly correct me, boosted them to a neurotypical level. Yeah, so at least in terms of this measurement, the what I would call the fluency in the visual language um, put them on par with neurotypical individuals, um, which was very, very interesting. So it essentially said that, you know, they do have uh, a difference in processing inferences without this. But with this experience, it allows them to kind of uh, have a different uh, information that they bring to bear on this. And in terms of the thesis we talked about before, where I talked about the semantic versus narrative processing, yes. um, I think that this might have a lot to do with that. Because what we show in my research with Emily Coderre is that the semantic processing is typically um, what is attenuated or what is... Um, uh, 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 processed in a different way than neurotypical individuals. But, um, and that's what would be at work, at least in part with inferencing. But the narrative structure is, like I said, really just about patterns. And so if you have, you can't, um, uh, uh, fluency is basically learning the patterns. So if you're able to learn the patterns and gain proficiency in learning the patterns, you might be able to rely on those patterns without having to use the uh, semantics or go through the patterns to get to the meaning more often, which means that that is it kind of provides a scaffolding by which you can more proficiently understand this information and your um, data or process it in a way that is more common, similar to a neurotypical. Individual. And your data suggests that those patterns can be, those patterns in comics can be um, internalized, can be learned. Yeah, so I mean, so this is when we talk about my current research, um, this is like one of the biggest things that I'm of interest of lately. And this is the topic of a paper that I have coming out. And this is also the uh, topic of an upcoming book that I have coming out next year, um, which is all about this issue of proficiency and the degree to which um, one, understanding a sequence of images does not come for free. And there are people in the world who can't understand sequences of images because they don't have exposure to them kids don't understand sequence of images until about age five or six, yeah. um, which is quite a bit later than a lot of people assume. Um, so, um, and these issues related to uh, individuals with autism and other sorts of um, uh, neurodiversities would then be also, are also discussed in this. Um, and I think really what it comes down to is the, the, this aspect of learning and fluency. And we show with my regular uh, uh, basic research that comic reading proficiency modulates all sorts of responses. It modulates brain responses, re reaction times, reading times, ratings, um, all sorts of things are modulated by the degree to which people are familiar with and frequently uh, reading comics. So 
proficiency, and this is what you would expect if something is structured in similar to a language or is a language, um, because languages require fluency. Um, and so uh, I, I think to get back to your earlier point about uh, medicine, um, you know, if you flip the conversation around, as you implied, when you say, well, can we then use, you know, comic reading proficiency as a way to, uh, uh, you know, improve people's lives, for example, um, that is a, a, a reasonable hypothesis to make. We don't have that much evidence. I mean, other than, of course, all of us who really love comics and read comics and get a lot out of them, obviously it's improving our lives. Yes. But in a cognitive sense of improving, like, say your reading comprehension or your perception or things like that. We just don't know. There's not enough research out there, but that's certainly something that one could test. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence and we yeah. have self-report. We do, I don't think we have evidence against it in any way. I don't know that we have evidence that have tested how comics hold people back, which was the scare of the 1950s and earlier, but you're right that there's still work that could be done here. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's just a lot of unknowns. Um, I think that there's um, a greater likelihood for certain things than others. Uh, so certainly like in the study, Alexander's Blum, Blum study, where he shows that comic reading proficiency helps people understand the inferences within comics. Um, whether that can also translate to bare text reading comprehension is also an unknown. Whether that translates to other things as well, that's also an un un unknown. Um, and I'll also make a, a point, as I do in these recent works, that the use of sequential images in medicine and um, uh, diagnostics has been around for 50, 60 years. So things like arrange these panels into a sequence that makes sense is a common staple of IQ tests. Um, and one of the arguments I make is that it's not testing anything that anybody thinks it's testing. Um, really, it's testing uh, fluency effects and the, the effects that you find across different populations, including neurotypical individuals, are not indicative of IQ. They're not indicative of um, uh, spatial reasoning or sequential reasoning or temporal cognition or theory of mind or any of the many, many things that people have claimed and still claim that this indicates, I think it's actually more indicative of the degree to which you have proficiency in the visual language. Um, and this is just amazingly something that none of the studies that use this ever account for or ask people about. None of these studies have ever, I haven't seen any study that, that uses these diagnostics that asks people, how often do you read comics? Right. And that seems like it's an important question to ask. Okay, so I will break one rule. I've had one question come up. Yeah, we bring it. Time for it. Uh, we have one participant asking, Bongard problems in this category? What does that mean um, to you? Yeah, uh, I'm afraid I don't know what Bongard problems are. Um, if they are, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't answer your question better. Um, uh, used in IQ assessment. So would that be something that's like a sequence of images, like a comic that asks you about to understand the sequence, something like that? Is that, uh, is that the case? I think they think um, we're focusing on uh, IQ tests and uh, flaws there. Sorry to... Yes, it is. Thank you for filling me in there, uh, Dex. Um, so yes, I would categorize that as well. I'd have to know more about the task specifically, but um, if it's a task that uses the patterns of essentially comics um, and Mensa, yeah. So those sorts of uh, tasks most likely are going to be modulated by the degree to which people read comics. Um, but I highly doubt that people ask about comic reading experience when they are administering these tests. Um, I, I feel yeah. responsible. I should push this just a little bit further. I think we can go past 50 or 60 years for these tests. I think we can go all the way back to a much earlier medical illustration and sequences of mm. medical illustration that, that dates back more towards the hundreds of years uh, timeline than just uh, the 20th century. I want to keep going, but we can. I am <laughs> out of tea. Ah, um, uh, yes. So <laughs> That's an important measurement. It, it really is. <laughs> uh, perhaps we'll get to do this another time. Uh, in the yeah, I'd love to. 
in the chance that we don't, how can people reach you? Where should they go to read your materials? Uh, yeah, they can go to my website, which is visuallanguagelab.com. Uh, my email is at the bottom of every page. You're welcome. To, anybody's welcome to email me and I will respond. Um, and um, uh, any, uh, you can always reach me on uh, social media. The best one would be Twitter, which is uh, visual underscore linguist on Twitter at visual underscore linguist. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with re replying um, and people are welcome to reach out. In Twitter, what if we're not? Uh... If you're not on Twitter, um, well, if you have email, then you go to my email address, uh, which is Neil Cohn at visuallanguagelab.com. Uh, which is also on my website. Um, and if you happen to be in the Netherlands, we should. And if you happen to be in the Netherlands, you're welcome to drop me a line. <laughs> I'm, I'm in Tilburg, at Tilburg University. I remain um, such a fan of your work, Neil, and of you personally. Um, oh, thanks very much. That's very kind. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time today, and I hope we can continue the conversation. Yeah, I'd love to do it any anytime. Just let me know, and uh, happy to arrange another conversation. This is very fun, and thank you for all of you who uh, joined in in the muted chat. And Dex, thank you for all the uh, additional tw uh, messages and questions. Uh, very interesting. I'll look up the Bogart problem some more. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm A. David Lewis. Take care.